I'm Gold Derby editor Daniel Montgomery here with Star Trek Picard composers Frederick Weidman and Stephen Barton. Uh, now, you know, before you, you know, came on board Picard, uh, what was your relationship to the Star Trek franchise? Uh, you know, were you fans, and 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 how much, uh, you know, was that a part of your life? Uh, let's start with uh, Frederick. Oh, I love that question. Um, yeah, I mean, I was 12 years old when I discovered the existence of soundtracks in the first place. The very first one I had was um, Dances with Wolves by John Barry, which was it's still one of my favorite scores ever. And, um, you know, I grew up in a small town in Germany, so finding film scores on CD was not an easy task. There was no Amazon. Um, there was a couple of small CD shops here and there. And, you know, you kind of were at the mercy of what they had available. You couldn't really order anything. It was like, here's your soundtrack section, this small shelf right here. And um, I found this 30-year Star Trek anniversary CD, which was like a compilation of everything that Star Trek had, you know, musically to offer since the past 30 years. And this was back in uh, 1991, 92, something like that. Yeah. So anyway, I, I bought that soundtrack and absolutely devoured it. And it was the first time when I discovered Jerry Goldsmith as a composer. Um, James Horner as well. Uh, not, not James Horner yet. Uh, Alexander Courage. I forgot who else is on there. But it, I mean, it was like getting to know those themes and the music of the show that I had already been watching because it was on in Germany on repeat. I was a big fan. That was my first encounter with Star Trek. And um, so when I decided to become a film composer shortly after that, you know, to be ever working on a franchise like this was something that felt very much out of reach. But here I am. So did... Yeah, so my introduction to Star Trek was, um, uh, it was the first show I ever really remember watching that wasn't like a kid's show, like wasn't like some sort of Saturday morning cartoon or something like that. Um, and it was the first show that everybody watched um, in the family. And so so it's it's sort of, I, that was Next Generation. Um, and I remember the first season premiering and, you know, what, what a sort of big deal it was. And hadn't I hadn't seen any of the original series at that point. So so I always knew that new Next Gen as my first Star Trek experience, really. And so after that, then, uh, you know, kind of was it, that had a very big impact. I mean, it definitely was a was a was a big Star Trek fan, um, you know, through through sort of the 90, you know, kind of 1990 when the season three, the the best of both worlds um, part one, the season uh, and and for that season, I remember the summer of 1990 being all about the cliffhanger that 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 left. Uh, you know, with with Riker, you know, essentially firing on the ball cube, and you're like, I, and the cutest, and you're like, how are they getting out of this? And I just remember it as being the first sort of cliffhanger I ever saw. I mean, so you know, there's so many kind of concepts of like what what it means to watch television that that come for me come from that. I mean, that was the 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 first. So so was always very much a big fan. Um, went to see First Contact in 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 cinemas, which I very much enjoyed telling Jonathan Frakes, which of course he then turned around and said, like, oh well now I feel old. Thanks for that. You know, <laughs> in his <laughs> inevitable way. Um and uh yeah, you know, I mean just a, a just just very much part of you know childhood growing up. It was it was always it's you know it's been an interesting franchise because it's I think it has you know, in a way that Star Wars maybe didn't because it Star Wars sort of dipped away for a while. And, uh, you know, and obviously with the, the prequel trilogy came out, it sort of came back. But Trek has been sort of omnipresent, really, in the last 40, 50, you know, plus years of our culture. So, yeah, a huge, huge influence on me. Uh, and what was the collaborative process like between the two of you having having two composers on, on the score? Uh, Stephen? Well, that basically came about because... Uh, we got we had a, a, an idea at the very beginning. Terry Metalis and I sat down and we said, "What we actually don't want to do here is score this like TV at all." Um, and from the standpoint of saying, "Okay, well, if you're obviously you're scoring a, a next generation movie, every piece of music is written for its scene, and there's no reuse of music, and it is just its own standalone entity." And we were like, 
well, that's actually what we really want to do for the season. And now, obviously, that immediately causes a massive problem because there's seven hours of music, at least, that you're going to need. Um, and it's a very music dense show. And we we inherited kind of a, a, a production schedule for because they shot season two and three back to back. So they posted them back to back. They literally rolled off the mix of one episode of, of the finale of season two. And then the following Monday morning, they started on season three, episode one. So... So we we basically kind of realized we sort of set ourselves this insane mountain. And we got to about episode six and I'd written about four hours of music in the space of oh, maybe two and a half months coming up towards three months and it was just dead. I mean, I'd done the 16, 16 hour days, seven day weeks and, you know, everything that me and my team could 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 do to sort of, you know, well, like, you know, orchestration and copying and everything like that and getting, because we're having to record all of these episodes too, you know, with live orchestra. So so at that point, Terry and I were just sort of like, well, okay, do, do we sacrifice and do we like hand over episode two of these episodes over to a music editor to just to just cut? But the problem is, is when you look at the story arc, you can't possibly do that because it doesn't, there's no sort of episode seven fetch and carry little side questy sort of episode. The whole thing just keeps going up and up and up and up and up and and every scene is is important. And so we didn't want to have any unloved children here. So so basically what we ended up doing was we, we you know, we were sitting one afternoon and and, and kind of uh, looking at the schedule and saying okay well well let, we looked at episode seven and there was a ton of freddie's music in in it there was a score called operation rainfall because also because our one of our editors is brilliant at like temping um he pulls stuff from 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 all over the place and it wasn't really temped with very much star trek it was mostly from things from other places and so terry literally was just like what, what about what about if we call this guy do you think he would be up for it and i'm like yeah we should see and uh, I was like, but, you know, I mean, you want him to start tomorrow. There's a 50, 50 shot there as to whether he's just going to be like, I'm too busy. He can't possibly start tomorrow. Sorry. Uh, so, um, so yeah, we, we went to that with, with, and we didn't have a plan B and mercifully, mercifully the, the stars aligned uh, and Freddie was free. So, so that was incredible. Uh, mm. That saved, saved, saved the, 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 the vision of what we wanted to do. And Frederick, what was it? What was it like uh, getting that call and 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 sort of being uh, you know summoned for for this project uh, at the last minute like that? Well, first that infamous moment where Terry was supposedly emailing me ended up in my spam because uh, he emailed me through my website, which Terry seems to do. He he likes to you know reach out to people directly. So I think Stephen he reached out to you via Twitter when you guys met. For the yeah, first years ago. Yeah, years ago. Yeah. So and he he chose my website, which I never check because nobody who goes on websites these days it seems like such an old concept so um luckily they made another attempt through my agency who then reached out and said hey they would like you to work on star trek starting today if i can do it <laughs> and i think i found his, his email weeks later and was mortified that i didn't check it <laughs> but yeah i mean it was an amazing an amazing call to get this especially given how it how they even got to me you know like the fact that they found this rather obscure score of mine that quite frankly i even released myself there wasn't even a label i was just like i'm just going to put this out there because some somebody might enjoy it you know it was more like that and sure enough the editor miraculously found it on spotify on some sci-fi playlist and put it in star trek i mean what are the chances and the odds of that ever happening but anyway yeah it was an amazing moment for sure i it's it's definitely one for the books i mean i it's it's something you kind of wish will happen to you throughout your whole career that you have kind of found that way and it never you never think it's actually going to happen until it does so yeah amazing uh, and, yeah and there's so many references to past star trek in the story of course bringing back the next generation cast uh but you know there are also references in the score uh how did you balance you know bringing in the classic star trek music with you know having your own new compositions for for the show Frederick? I, oh, you, oh um, right. yeah, it's, you know, I, I think the credit to the structure of all of this, you know, for the most part, at least in my episodes, was definitely goes all to Terry, our showrunner, who had a very concrete idea on how he wanted this to be musically. And Terry is incredibly music savvy and soundtrack savvy, too. He he knows more about soundtracks than I believe I do, um, and specifically Star Trek. So he had this thing all mapped out and with help of our amazing editor they created this temp score you know in the editing room that was basically our roadmap to go after and it was all pretty much there in terms of where things would play 
And it, then it was a matter of letting us run with it and see how we, how we can do that in the best possible way to keep it cohesive and, you know, not to, not to, here's this theme and now it stops again, you know, cause there's a, there's a danger in running into that, but you, when you're quoting so many things that it feels too, too, um, QE, like here's the character. Yeah. Here's the theme. Oh, I, think, I think the, the big part of that was really that, um, you know, you don't merely want to press the button and be like, Oh, insert, yeah. you know, it's not a sort of paint by numbers thing. And, you know, and one of the nice things was actually drew, you know, attempt with a lot of when, you know, a lot of non Star Trek music and, and sort of, but there was, there was, I mean, down to the script level, there were references, even in the script one or two, particularly with, you know, for example, the legacy sequence with the fleet museum that we, where we knew we were going to go there. But what was really nice about that was you get to focus on, on, on the how and not just merely just sort of, you know, sort of insert, insert Voyager here theme because, you know, Jerry Ryan's on screen, fantastic job done, but actually looking at the ethos of the original scores. And so, for, for, you know, for example, in that particular sequence, I mean, the, 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 the thing that I looked at most was looking at the fight. I went back and rewatched the final episode of Voyager and, and watching it how a lot of the time when you would expect the music to go big, it actually goes small. It's very, it's actually quite restrained. And it's sort of as, you know, kind of even like the very ending shots of Voyager, you know, they arrive and she's like, oh, it'll all be in my report. It's a very, it's a, there's, there, there are not 15 endings with every, seeing everybody happy. It's a very sort of, you know, kind of understated ending. And so one of the things we wanted to do with that was to honor that ethos um, of how that was, how that was scored. And so when, when we use the Voyager theme, at that point, it doesn't it doesn't play big as a sort of big heroic moment. It actually plays as a very sort of almost quite wistful uh, moment with just two two li- two two melodic lines, m- melodic line, and there's like the bass line just following with it. It's very very simple, and actually it all drops out and almost sort of sucks out and sort of is just very spare. And that that I think was uh, you know looking looking at the way that certain parts of the the, the franchise have been scored and the pro- approach they've taken and, and, and honoring that as well, not merely just looking at the theme itself um looking at the way dennis mccarthy scores the the you know the final sequence when you know they're on the the after they've as Shaw puts it hot drops the uh the d saucer section onto onto a planet um they're they, you know they're in the wreckage and picard and riker are there, and that, that's such a, a poignant scene and so when we came to turn off the lights for the enterprise d in episode 10 looking at the ethos of that and, and looking at the ethos of how how ron jones does things at the end of best of both worlds or how um uh, you know, just 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 the 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 more than the the, the sort of surface level theme, but the, the the deep deep sort of aspect of how how what made it feel like the way it does, um, and and honoring that too. And what I noticed, like while working with those tunes, is like how incredibly timeless they are, because it didn't really need a lot of work to put it into our you know slightly more contemporary uh, arrangements or score for, for that for that matter. Because they 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 just really stood the test of time. All the tunes that I've been able to use, they just fit right in. It's it's quite amazing. Um, and you know the the compositions for the season were so uh, you know a lot of you know grand moments, very memorable, very uh, cinematic. Uh, what was it? What was the recording process like? Bringing it to life with like an entire orchestra. Oh. <laughs> Crazy, uh, because we, I mean, get, this was an interesting one where we, 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 you know, we came right off season two, and you know, where, where, with, with Jeff was doing so, so phenomenal work, and it was, uh, and we, we sort of inherited a, a schedule from that, and almost sort of to a degree of budget as well. But um, you know, CBS, I think, were very quickly realized, you know, there, there are episodes in episode season two that are only 38, 39 minutes long. I think a couple of them, and then you know, our finale sixty something, and so you're like, that's almost two of these and so we sort of you know kind of i think once they started realizing oh hang on a minute this is this this is just a very different different movie um the biggest challenge was that we just had so much music so we literally walked into the session and i what was amazing about every part of this show particularly you know from from shooting it was like everyone would walk onto these sets particularly the enterprise d set and just be like you're walking onto hallowed ground and this uh, very much we kind of got the same thing on the music side where we had players a number quite a number of players who had played on certainly on first contact some had played on next gen episodic sessions some of them some of the old, old players had played on those um and certainly had basically seen the legacy firsthand lots of them knew jerry lots of them knew james um and so so i think they walked in and saw what was on the stand and 
twigged what we were trying to do. Um, and so we, you know, one session we walked in, we, we had 42 minutes of music to record um, in three hours, which if you ask any composer, I'd be like, that's don't, don't you, you wouldn't even dream of doing that. It's an insane idea. Um, like you, you it was a ridiculous idea, but we basically said, look, we're going to have to, like, this is going to have to virtually first take, second take, and maybe we'll patch a bar, but like, but, but it was kind of a, I mean, obviously they knew the tunes, um, you know, where we were using the tunes and they got quite familiar with our new tunes, but, but they, you could just see in their eyes they were just sort of like okay this is a challenge and we're going to step up so we're going to we're going to so literally one this one session we without compromising we, we we cranked through 42 minutes of music and uh and to this day literally i think if you if you talk to a contractor and say uh we'd like to do that they, they they'd um laugh you out of the room but yeah. um but 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 yeah we did because, because i think no nobody said well it's impossible um we were like, okay, let's give it a go, and um, you know, everyone rose to it. And the the playing is the the, the most extraordinary I've ever heard out of the LA yeah. orchestra, and particularly in the finale when they re re recorded um the 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 Jerry Goldsmith um um and main main theme next gen main theme, but that's also the original motion picture theme. You could just see you could just see all the players just like realizing that this is probably the last time that anyone's going to record this actual theme for an actual show, maybe. And well, we better make it good. Um and. Uh, yeah, I mean, we did three or four takes of that, and just was just mind blowing. Yeah. It just, it just yeah. sounded incredible. So, yeah, these are like the. I mean, these are the, the if, you know, one of the or if not the best players in the world is in, in LA. These session players, they're so incredible. It's, it's a, uh, it's goosebump inducing when you're standing in front of them and hearing them fill the room with the live with the live music. It's just amazing. Nothing like it. Um, and do each of you have a, a favorite compositions or an episode that you're especially proud of from your work on the show? Uh, yeah, you mentioned the finale, uh, uh, Stephen. Uh, I well, it's it's hard, you know. It's like there's lots of you know, one doesn't want anyone to love children in this in, in this one, and the, I think there's so many moments I'm happy with, uh, you know, beyond beyond well the streams really, just to even get to do them. Um, particularly for me, I think the my favorite was probably the to seek out new life sequence from the end of episode four, um, just because uh, you know it comes after you know you know ep episodes three is so dark and episode four is dark for a lot of it and that you get this wonderful sort of sort of sense of catharsis at the end of that episode. But it was uh, it was it was something that really it, and it's the new it's where we sh we reveal our family theme, which is our sort of the you know one of our other major new themes for the season and. I, I just to be able to sort of write a really big sweeping sort of Star Trek moment like that, I, I think is 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 you know you don't you don't get to do many of those. Um uh or you have one hope, well, or maybe maybe one will, I don't know. Uh but the it's a very special, special thing to be able to to record that. Um and so that that's that 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 sticks in in my mind as probably the the the, the moment that, that gave me the biggest goosebumps. Yeah, I think the most satisfying moment for me was um episode nine the ending when they're going on the enterprise again the crew firing everything up and then taking off i mean that was a very very um, like, amazing sequence to get to score because there's so much legacy tied to that and it was very i felt a lot of pressure because it, it, it was a scene that was very dear to everybody involved and we knew the fans would respond to it accordingly too so it had to be done right and um you know using the these amazing Goldsmith themes and Alexander Courage's theme throughout this entire s sequence and finding ways to rearrange it to make it even bigger and more epic when it eventually takes off the Enterprise at the end. It was a real fun, a real fun one to, to work on. Um, with, like, it caused me to sweat a lot in the studio too, just because of the immense pressure it, it, it brought to me. But yeah, I think that was my most satisfying moment when it was done to finally hear it performed live. Like, okay, well, that my, my favorite out. my my favorite bit of that was because I was on I was on set for that 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 shoot uh, the, those couple of days and um it's the only set I've ever been on where you know they always they always didn't need a first AT I mean it was like you know I've just everyone was you know the the atmosphere was just incredible because you knew what you were watching what it represents for 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 you know the history of television really and in terms of you know this is something a milestone moment and so you know no one really wanted to 
to talk between takes or talk you know it was like that you're just watching watching this happen and so so that was that was incredibly special uh, you know you could have heard a pin drop on those sets um mm -hmm. uh, and you, you know I, which i think will make our production sound mixes very happy because that's that you know often that isn't the case uh but this was no it's just incredible it's a, an am amazing privilege to be able to be part of it so yeah well, I want to uh, congratulate you both on your work on the show this season, um, and uh, it's a pleasure listening to it uh, during the show and after the fact, um, and uh, thank you so much for talking about it with me today. Well, thank you for having us. Pleasure, pleasure to be here.